All month long, <clears throat> you that have been here know that we've been preaching a series of messages on the church. We've come to the concluding message of our series. Many times in our church attendance, many have the tendency to say, we're just too busy, we just don't have time, or we choose to do something else. But what you often fail to realize is that uh, what you're really missing out on, to be sure the, each one of us today has problems and you have things that trouble you and we always have something on our minds. Did you realize that the service that you miss might be the opportunity for the Lord to speak directly to your need? By the time we finish today, hopefully you will learn the value of attending services of your local church. Many do not realize what they're missing and today we're going to look into that. Since we are a consumer-driven society, our world has no shortages of things to offer you. One thing, standing between the devil and having free reign on the earth, is the local church. No wonder the devil is going full throttle to silence the message of all churches. Isn't it true that we fully don't appreciate something until it is gone? If the present trends continue, we will continue to experience the impact of a Christless society. Now just think a minute of what a Christless society would look like without the church. Feeding centers, daycare centers, all philanthropic work would cease in the outreach of our communities. Did you realize the downtrodden and the elderly, all of those ministries that churches do all over the world, they would cease if the local church went out. And beloved, can I tell you this? I can see the trends as certainly as you can. The devil is absolutely has a great big bullseyes on churches today. Because here's what he knows. If he can silence our message, then I guarantee you, then the world is going to get more corrupt and more corrupt and more corrupt. Today, it's exciting when someone comes to, to know the Lord and you see their growth and you see what God does in their life and you see how God is just leading them and feeding them and, and pretty soon they start being active in the church and as the Bible says, all things become new. It's exciting to be around a new believer in Christ Jesus. Now, some in this room has, has experienced this and, uh, we understand how, it, how great it is to watch you grow in grace. But did you know that there is somebody in our Bibles that missed a real golden opportunity? Somebody in our Bibles that just missed an event that could have changed their life forever. With that said, I'll invite your attention to the stand with me as we turn to John chapter 20. John chapter 20. And as you find in your place, John chapter 20, scan down, if you will, to verse number 24. John chapter 20 and verse number 24. The Bible says it this way. But Thomas, even those couple of words there is very interesting. We'll try to develop that in a short time we have. But Thomas, one of the twelve, mark this in your Bible, was not with them when Jesus came. Now, wait a minute. Before you tune out, let's at least get this part. The Bible says he was not with them when Jesus came. Now, I don't know about you, but where Jesus was, I certainly would want to be there. But for some reason, Thomas chose to be somewhere else. And did you realize the Bible gives us some very clear-cut choices you and I can make? We're going to look at those this morning. Let's bow. Father, I pray, and in in, in, Lord, I know that the time is short this e this morning, and I know, Lord, that people have got so much on their plate. And Father, I I, I certainly know that in our corrupt and crooked world today, Lord, our minds are flooded with so many images and thoughts. But Father, please, can we just stop just a moment in the rush of society and just for a few minutes to learn of you? 
Lord, I ask that we could put aside those things that are plaguing us and for those things, Lord, that's just demanding our attention this morning. Some have come in here and already thought about their work schedule next week. Some have come in here and thought about some hobbies and some things that you'd much rather be doing. But Father, I know that the power of the gospel can change us. And I also know the power of the gospel can transform us if we'll allow it. Lord, and if there's somebody in this room that is an eager seeker this morning, I pray that they'll find their way to to Jesus this morning. Lord, not by my words, but by the powerful incorruptible, infallible word of the living God. Father, fill us with fresh oil today. Comfort us, Lord, for those that are hurting. Revive us for those that have been dead in spirit. And Father, do a work in your midst. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. In John chapter 20 and verse number 24, if you're... If you have your Bibles open, I'll also ask you to notice this. In, in, in John 20, 24, you'll notice the word Didymus. You may not be familiar with that term, but, uh, that also Didymus means twin. It literally means twin. Apparently, Thomas had a twin brother or sister, but they're just not named in scripture. Thomas only appears in 12 verses in the gospel record. In the gospel of John, quotes uh, Thomas twice. In John chapter 11 and verse number 16, the Bible says this, Then said Thomas, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us go that we may die with him. Very interesting statement. And in John 14, 5, Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest, and how can we know the way? Many who are familiar with their Bibles know that Thomas was also given a nickname called Doubting Thomas. You could say that Thomas was a pessimist. He seemed to look for the negative side of all situation. Someone said he was on the lookout for the dark side of life. But we would also have to admit that maybe we have read him wrong. Because in that John eleven sixteen passage, Jesus is going to go raise Lazarus from the dead. And Thomas knows that our Lord had enemies and that Jesus might die. And Thomas was willing to go with Jesus and to die with him if it was necessary. And certainly he challenged those other disciples to do the same. And in that John 14, 5 passage, Jesus is telling the disciples that he's going away. And Thomas responds by asking the Lord some questions. His questions are not motivated by doubt, but only by wanting to know more. So, can I tell you this? We understand that when... When, when Jesus was walking the earth and, and Thomas was a part of the original 12 disciples, can I tell you, being with Jesus those three, three years had to be a thrill of his life. Now somebody look up here and just amen me, all right? It had to be an awesome experience to be around Jesus for those, uh, for those months. Now why? Well, f- for nothing else, just to watch him. Amen. Just to watch how Jesus operates. How does Jesus operate? Well, can I tell you this? I don't know about you, but I would have loved to heard Jesus pray. I would have just loved just to, just to, just to hear his prayer life. I, I would imagine it probably, watch, his prayer life was probably a little bit better than ours. Wouldn't you, wouldn't you love to watch him how to, how he interacted with people? We told you, we told you Wednesday night, the reason that I think Jesus was such a, a, a interesting character for nothing at least for lack of words was this. Because when the scribes and Pharisees would walk around, they walked around with this pompous attitude and with this scowl on their face. But when Jesus walked around, he walked around with joy on his face. And I would have just imagined that Jesus attracted people. How do I know this? Because when you read the Gospels, what does it say? Multitudes, multitudes flocked around him. Now, can I tell you this? If you was a sourpuss, you're probably not going to draw a good crowd like that. So I'm just imagining Jesus was interacting with people. And can I tell you, and we don't see this, I, I imagine Jesus laughed a lot. And let me just go out on a limb. I imagine Jesus smiled a lot, just like you're doing this morning. 
Well, maybe not like you're doing this morning, but just pretend. <laughs> and I really believe that he enjoyed being around people. I think when he walked into a town that he can converse, he can converse with the, with the rich, he can converse with the lowly. He can converse with anybody. And I really believe that he enjoyed being with people. So here was Thomas that saw all of these things and dimension the miracles that that guy got to see. Amen. Now, how would you like to have seen Jesus do some kind of miracle? Amen. I've always thought about this, but how would you like to see Jesus feed the multitudes? That's always been an intriguing thing to me. Amen. Over and over, Jesus is pulling out this fish and this bread. Where is he getting it? It just keeps coming and keeps coming and keeps... I, I don't know. I just like to have seen that. And certainly, wouldn't it be awesome to see Jesus raise people from the dead? You know, you know what the Bible says? He, you remember that, that, that story where the, the mother lost her son and they were going out and Jesus touched the briar? You remember that? This lady was ready to bury her son, and Jesus came by, and the boy popped up. Now, how would you like to have seen that? Great stuff. And all of a sudden, Thomas is involved in all of that, and now Jesus is crucified, and Jesus is dead. And I'm going to tell you this, I just think that he took the death of Jesus very, very, very hard. Notice, if you will, John chapter 20, verse number 19. Let's get into this. Then the same day at evening, now watch this, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, watch, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Now underscore the words, came Jesus and stood in the midst. This was the first Easter Sunday night. Everybody look. The first Easter Sunday night, where did Jesus go? He went to be with his men. Now, I, you, you, you're still not getting this. Okay, watch. <laughs> Easter Sunday night, not Easter Sunday morning. Easter Sunday night, Jesus came. Now, some of you would know that because you don't know what a Sunday night looks like, but I'm just telling you that uh, on this occasion, here was Jesus. Now, Thomas wasn't there, and guess who, guess who could have had his fears relieved? Guess who could have had his questions answered? And guess who could have had his hope restored? It would have been Thomas. He was not in his place. One, pe one reason people miss church is because many have already made up their minds that they're not going to get anything out of it. They hop and they skip and they come when it's convenient for them and they have nothing left. They, they don't have any desire for that. Let me tell you. Here in a moment, you're going to see exactly why Thomas missed and why it was important for him to be there and those truths, uh, truths could be uh, applied to you. Now, here's my question. Everybody look up here. I'll skip some of this. Here's my question to you. Why? Do you come to church? The answer that is is in many of your minds is, well, because I don't have anything else to do and the Cowboys aren't playing. Okay, we'll take that. Why do you come to church? Well, because I just do. I, I, I really don't have a reason. It's just one of those things. I, I come every now and then, preacher. Aren't you glad? Yeah, I'm, I'm very glad about that. But why do you come? Let me give you this. And maybe it'll help you understand why we come to church. And why, why is it important? Desmond Doss was born to a working class parents in Virginia in 1919. Doss volunteered for, for the army during World War II. Due to his deep religious convictions that God had called him to never carry a weapon, he trained as a medic and was assigned to a rifle company. Doss' convictions earned him ridicule, abuse, and contempt from his fellow soldiers and even his superiors, but he never wavered. But all that changed in April of 1945, when Doss' company fought the Battle of Okinawa, the bloodiest battle of the Pacific War. The key to winning was gaining a Japanese stronghold atop a 400-foot cliff 
the Americans called, listen to this, the Americans called Hacksaw Ridge. A bloody battle raged, but the Japanese held their ground. Finally, Doss's battalion was ordered to retreat, but Doss could see the American bodies across the field. He stayed behind, and with machine gun and artillery fire bursting around him, he ran repeatedly into the kill zone, carrying wounded GIs to the edge of the cliff, and single-handedly lowered them to safety. For 12 hours, he kept going back until he was sure that there were no more wounded Americans. By the time he finally left, Dost saved the lives of 75 men. Days later, the Americans took Hacksaw Ridge while Doss lay wounded in a hospital. When his commanding officer brought him the precious charred and soggy Bible he lost in the initial assault, he was told that every man in the company, the same men who once ridiculed, ridiculed him for his faith, had insisted on searching for his Bible until it was found. For his feat, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Years later, he was asked how he found the strength to continue that night. Listen to this. His answer was very simple. Each time, he said, he lowered, he finished lowering another wounded man to safely down the cliff. He prayed, Lord, just help me get just one more. Why do we come to church? Lord, Help us get just one more. You see, you never know the service you miss might be the service that God has designed just especially for you to assist you, to get you out of harm's way, to remove you from the danger zone. D.L. Moody said these, listen to this, Brother Chris, I think it's up on the screen. D.L. Moody said this quote, church attendance is as vital to a disciple as a transfusion of rich, healthy blood to the sick man. I like that. Pastor David Platt says this, Do you realize the weight of the one who has invited us to follow him is as worthy of more than church church attendance and casual association? Listen to this. He is worthy of total abandonment and supreme adoration. Amen. Church father Tiltillion wrote this, The blood of the martyrs, is a seed of the church. With all that said, the bottom line is, if church attendance was not necessary for our spiritual growth, for the foundation of our faith, then Christ would have gave, given us something else. Amen. It's not just attending, but it's attaching yourself to the blessings and fellowship of like-minded believers who have given the time for you, and as Christ has died for you, to give you a purpose inside of your local church. Somebody amen. Here in our text verse in John chapter 20, it's very interesting verse, and several questions comes to mind that we're going to answer for you briefly this morning. Now, we understand during this time that the crucifixion was big news in and all around Jerusalem. Jesus of Nazareth was publicly beaten, battered, and he bruised. And everyone knew that he was dead. And Peter and John went to the tomb. But I want you to notice something especially in John 20, verse 3. John chapter 20 and verse number 3. Let's look at this right quick. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, talking about John, and came to the sepulcher. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter. And came first to the sepulcher, talking about John. And stooping down and looking in, he saw the linen clothes lying. And he went not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and seeth the linen clothes lie and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, John, which came first to the sepulcher. Watch. And he saw and believed. Now something was up and something was certainly different. And could it be that Jesus had indeed risen from the dead? Was it possible for Jesus to be alive? The evidence was clear that the tomb was empty. But where was Jesus? And you can be sure that the disciples had questions. But could he have actually survived that crucifixion? 
the disciples would find out, but Thomas was gone. Now let me give you this very quickly. I'm nearly done. Hang with me. Why is it necessary for you to come every time the church doors are open? Why is it necessary for you to come and be part of this local church? Number one, let me give you some reasons, Brother Chris. Look what Thomas missed because he was not in his place. Are, are you still with me this morning? Number one, he missed peace. Notice something in John chapter 20, verse number 19. Jesus said this twice. He says in John 19, 20, 19, peace be unto you. John 20, 21, peace be unto you. For the one whole week, Thomas missed the Lord's peace. He had additional trouble and fear. Skipping church does not promote peace. Everybody look up here and at least grunt or look at me. Listen to me. I understand this. Some of you don't want to hear this. I get that. I feel that this morning. But I want to tell you something. Think about Thomas here. He was close to the Lord Jesus Christ. He was not in his place. And Jesus came into those, to the, to the room, to those that were there and said peace twice. Why would Jesus say it twice? Was one, was once necessary? Yeah. Was twice necessary? Evidently. Why? Because Jesus read their hearts. He knew what they needed in that exact moment was peace of mind. Where was Thomas? Nowhere to be found. Let me just tell you this. Some of you think this is no big deal, so let's just go ahead and say it. For one whole week, Thomas carried around extra anxieties. For one whole week, Thomas did not have peace of heart. For one whole week, he probably ate a whole roll of Rolaids. For one whole week, he had to take Xanax and all of the over-counter medicine he could find. Why? Because Jesus was crucified and he just could not come to grips with that. Now, maybe, maybe an extra week of all these anxieties and maybe an extra week of all of these fears is not a big deal to some of you. But I, can I tell you this? Wouldn't it have been great if he had all of those questions answered? Watch. He could have if he was in his place. Secondly, not only did he miss peace, he missed proof. Now what was it? Now think about this. All of these, all of these guys certainly saw and understood that, listen to me. They understood that Jesus died. And at that first meeting with the disciples as a group after the resurrection, Jesus did something that was unique. Are you ready for this? John chapter 20, verse number 20. Notice what he says. And when he had said, so said, now watch. He showed unto them his hands in his side. Now wait, wait, just a minute. This is good. Are you still with me? This is good. Jesus just appears in the room. Now, now maybe that's not, maybe you've watched enough uh, Bewitched when you was growing up, and so maybe that's not a big deal to you. But can I tell you, for those disciples to just to be there, and here's Jesus appearing unto them, and he's saying this, peace be unto you, peace be unto you. And they're sitting there thinking, uh-oh, what's this all about? And then Jesus does this. He says, guys, I know you're still troubled, so let me, let me, let me show you something. Let me show you. Watch. It is me that's in your midst. This is not a bad dream. I did rise from the grave. How do you know that? Jesus says, just look at my hands and look at my side. Now, I don't know about you, but wouldn't that have been a neat occasion to be in that room? And Jesus is authenticating who he was. Not that he needed to do it. He knew who he was, but those guys needed something at that time. So Jesus said, just look, it is I. And can I tell you, I don't know, we don't get the written record of everything, but do you imagine Peter probably said something? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Because he always had something to say. Can you imagine in that room, he might have just said, oh, Jesus, it is really you. Jesus says, yes. 
Guys, I tried to tell you prior to the crucifixion what exactly was going to happen to me. Time after time after time, I told you I was going to go to Jerusalem. I told you they were going to beat me. I told you that something exciting was going to happen, but you just could not hear it. So here I'm telling you, I'm giving you all, listen, I'm giving you authority to look at my hands and my side. He gave them proof. Where was Thomas? He didn't get that proof because he'd rather be somewhere else. He'd rather be somewhere else and not in the house of God. Number three, watch this. Not only did he not get the proof, look at this. He missed pleasure. Now, what are you, what are you talking about that? Imagine the joy that the other disciples experienced. If you still have your Bibles, notice John twenty twenty. Watch. Then... Why, 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 why is he saying then? Because what we just said, then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. What, what do you mean they were glad? Well, can I tell you this? If you were all bent out of shape and if you were hiding from the Jewish authorities and if you believed that Jesus was really dead and didn't understand what your future held and what anything else, all of a sudden Jesus comes in this room, he shows you his hands and his side, and the Bible says, They were glad. Don't you think that that's probably a huge word to them? They were glad. What what, what do you think they went? What do you think they did in that room? Do you think they probably said, well, we are so glad to see you, Jesus. Do you think maybe glad is kind of an understatement just a little bit? What do you mean glad? They were thrilled to death that this man they thought would change the world was dead. Now he's alive. He's appearing to them. He's having this conversation with them. And the Bible says they are glad. Where was Thomas? Wasn't experiencing this. Wasn't experiencing this. For one extra week, he carried around all of this baggage and all of this turmoil. And can I tell you, he was a negative person anyway. Can you imagine what his mind was feeding him through that week? Come on, come on, come on with me. Can you imagine what he was thinking? Can you imagine the thoughts that the devil was given to him? Why? Because, somebody tell me, he was not in his place. Look at the next one. This is what people are searching for today. He missed purpose. At this service, Thomas skipped Christ, and he gave the disciples, the Christ gave his disciples an assignment. Now watch this. In John chapter 20, verse number 21, Thomas wasn't there, so look what his disciples got that Thomas did not. As my Father has sent me, even so send I you. What a powerful statement Jesus gave to those others. But Thomas missed it. Jesus gave him some look. I'm going to give you an assignment. And because this is so important, I don't want to miss it. Because what what my father gave to me, watch, I'm going to give to you. Where was Thomas? He's not there. Is anybody still following me? Look at number five. Not only did he miss purpose, he missed power. After meeting that first Sunday night, notice what the Lord said in John 20, 22. He breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. The disciples present were given the divine power to help them live for the Lord and help them serve the Lord. But Thomas lacked that power. Why? Because he was absent. And I don't know about you, but I'm not trying to make a bigger deal than what it ought to, but I'm going to tell you this. Sometimes when you come to a service and you've had a difficult week, and your body has betrayed you, you're weak, and you're discouraged, and you're down, and you don't know what to do, and your body says, don't go, don't go, don't go, and you come anyway. You finally figured this out, some of you, some time ago, you finally figured this out. There is something powerful when we meet together like this. There is something that happens when God's people assemble. I don't know about you, but it's it's some kind of a power that we get from the Lord Jesus Christ who empowers us, who encourages us, and tells us we can overcome. Yeah. Amen. Now, by the way, let me give you this. Each and every one of you in this room can be an overcomer. We're here this morning and 
many of you have had kind of weeks and you've, you've been a little bit all over. You've done all everything else. And you've come this morning and said, Preacher, I'm tired. I just wish you would hurry. I'm trying to hurry. Stay with me. But I'm going to tell you this. When we come together in God's presence here, there is things that God can do here that He's not going to do for you anywhere else. I just wished some of you would realize the power. The Bible says, now watch, watch. The Bible says he breathed on them. Wow. How would you like to have been a part of that service? Now, watch. Do, do you think maybe when he did that, the disciples were sitting there thinking, this is wonderful. Or did the disciples say, well, I wish he would hurry. I don't, I don't believe they did that. I believe when Jesus did what he did there that, 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 in, that, in that room, they were just so in awe of him. And I believe that just drew them closer to Christ. And, and, and by the way, that's what we try to do here for you, is draw us closer to him. Not, not, not to me. That, that's not important. But when you leave here, my desire is that you have a deeper love for Him than when you came in. But the Bible says, I, I, I started thinking about this so much that He breathed on them. Can I show you something else before we close? I, I was going to skip this, but I don't want to skip this. Because of what He missed, notice John twenty twenty five very quickly. John twenty twenty five. We're nearly done. The other disciples, therefore, said unto him, who's the him, it's Thomas, we have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, except I see in my hands in the print of his nails, put my finger in the print of his nails, and thrust my hand inside, I will not believe. He says, I'm not going to believe it. Thomas made it plain. He was not going to believe unless his conditions were met. His stubborn and problem of his heart was this, that he was not going to take the disciples' word for it. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Do you honestly think that these men that were with Jesus for three years, do you honestly think, come on, come on, do you honestly think that Peter and John would lie to Thomas? What did he say? I'm not going to believe your words. What was he saying? What was he saying? You're lying to me. Because I know Jesus is dead and I don't care what you have to say. I'm not going to believe you. That's a powerful statement. Can I tell you this this morning? Many times when we try to talk to people, that's exactly how obstinate they are to us. What do you mean? What do you mean you're not going to believe him? Jesus saved me. Well, I don't believe that stuff because it don't do nothing for me. Well, how do you know it don't do nothing for me? Well, because this is not my thing. Well, how do you know it's not your thing? Hey, I'm just not into that religion like you are. Well, can I tell you, I'm not into religion either. But I'm certainly into Jesus. It, It struck me as interesting that when Thomas says, I'm not going to believe. I want to show you this. It's, it's, it's interesting, and some of you probably already picked this out. In verse number 25, check this out. This passage of Scripture is the only place in the New Testament which speaks of nails piercing the Lord's feet and hands. Circle that somewhere. Thomas is telling uh, the others his terms, which would be the only way that he would believe. Now notice John chapter 20 and verse number 26. And after eight days again, the disciples were within. Watch, this is good. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut. What do you mean the doors being shut? Well, then how did Jesus get in? The Bible says he stood in their midst. And look what he said again. Peace be unto you. It is significant that Christ waited until Thomas was with the disciples before he came this second time. Now, I want you to get this before we close shop today. Christ did not appear to Thomas for his satisfaction. Thomas had to be where he was supposed to be before Christ gave Thomas a blessing. God is not in the habit of giving you extra opportunities when you neglect the good he tries to do for you every day of the week. 
If Thomas had missed this meeting, what do you think would have happened to him? Come on. Can I show you something? Verse number 27, watch. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach thither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach thither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. Now, two things are present here that I want to point out quickly. This shows the humility of Christ to save, and it shows that Christ is willing to help men believe. Now, watch this. Christ was willing to humble himself again to bring Thomas back. Christ was willing to die to save sinners. And now he was willing to show Thomas this major truth. God had given every opportunity for man to be saved more than enough. And don't criticize for God for failing to reach someone because he does more than you and I give him credit for. Look at John twenty twenty eight, And then we're done. But Thomas, and Thomas answered and says unto him, My Lord... And my God. I want you to underscore something that we missed in this verse. Look at the word my. It wasn't the disciples God. It wasn't the Pharisees God. Now he makes it personal. He says my God. Thomas made this statement from his own heart in front of the other disciples. Now wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute before I close. I don't want to miss this. You remember just in that previous week, that he said he would not believe the disciples? Now, what did he say? My Lord and my God. Who did he say this in front of? He said it in front of Christ, but he also said it in front of the disciples. Oh, Thomas had to eat a little crow now. Come on. You know why? Because exactly what John and Peter and the rest told him was exactly the truth. He would not believe it. But now he had to eat a little crow and says, <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. But indeed, that is him. All of this it has been wrapped up in this pretty bowl for you this morning. But I want you to see this. This verse 29 is written for you and I. This is our verse. Did you realize this verse is for you sitting in this room? It's not for the disciples. It's, it, it's for us. Look, this is for you. Watch. Jesus said unto him, Thomas. All right, preacher, this is for Thomas. But now wait. Because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed or happy are they which have not seen, yet have believed. Can I tell you something? I've never once rubbed the Lord's hands with those print of nails. I've never thrust my hand into his side and seen that. My thing was, is I accepted it by faith. Amen. And I simply believe exactly what Jesus said to me would happen, did happen. Now, how is all of this wrapped up for you? It is wrapped up just like this. Jesus said he would die. He died. Jesus said he would be buried. Jesus said he would rise again. And he did. Which means that. That, my friend, is called the good news of the Bible. Yeah. Amen. Anybody here needs some good news that's wrapped up in Jesus Christ. Think about it. He says, Lord, unless you go on my terms, I'm not going to believe but Jesus again showed how humble he was because he wanted to bring Thomas right back to the fold. Thomas, you got to have all of these miracles and you got to see, but there's people coming after you that will never see what you've seen today. But that they're going to believe. My Bible says, happy or blessed are they. If you're here this morning, did you realize you could be blessed? Did you realize this morning before you leave this room, you can totally have peace? You can totally have power? You can totally have these things that Thomas missed that first time? Why? Some of you are so troubled in your soul and so troubled in your mind, you can't even think straight anymore. You've got so much stinking thinking in your mind, and you haven't given God an opportunity to clean that mind up. And I'm asking you this morning, you have an opportunity today to come and get yourself right with God. 
Here's what the devil's telling some of you today. I got plenty of time. I can put that off. Listen to the preacher this morning because some of you need to hear it. This month, I can tell you, there's some people that I've encountered that thought they had plenty of time. Working fatalities this month. Those guys thought, they're young men. I have plenty of time. Picking up children last month. Nothing could be further from the truth. Preacher, they have plenty of time. Here's what I'm going to tell you. You have right now. By the way, let me just, so, so somebody will remember this. If something happens to me this week, I want you to, somebody to say at my funeral, here's what I want you to say, that every week he gave us an opportunity to come know Christ. And every week he implored us to come and visit Christ and to accept Christ as Savior. He wanted everybody he could possibly come in contact with to know the hope and joy that he knew. And I'm asking you, if you don't know Christ as your Savior this, this day, I'm asking you, why don't you give that a consideration? Because I would love to spend eternity with you one day. Would you at least consider it this morning? Would you bow your head and close your eyes? Do you know 100% certain that you would go to heaven if something were to happen to you? If you were to pull out on the boulevard this afternoon for some reason, do you know for certain that you would go to heaven? Have you ever come to that conclusion that you've invited Jesus into your heart? Has there been so much turmoil in your life that you have just pushed God just as far away as you can to pursue something that you had rather do? God has given us a rich opportunity this morning to come into His presence. To accept Him. Father, I pray, Lord, right now that You'd speak to a heart that Lord, I don't know who it could be. I, I have no idea. But Lord, that you could speak to someone and say, Preacher, I have just absolutely blown it. I'm certainly not living my life as I ought to, and I'm surely not showing my family the right way. In this quiet moment, would you be man or woman willing to say, I need a Savior. I need Christ to come and save me of my, in my heart that if something should happen to me, I know I'd go and be with Him for all eternity. Eternity is a very long time to be wrong. If you don't know Christ, you're wrong. Please, Lord, speak. Would you stand with me all over the room? This is your moment. This is your time. If you need special prayer, I certainly would pray with you this morning and ask God to give you what you need for a successful Christian life.